Hi, Grade 12. So I hope you guys are all keeping safe and um, taking care of each other. Today we are looking at our um, Paper 2 essay, the International Response to, um, to Apartheid. This is how the international community helped uh, with the um, internal community to end apartheid. We are breaking this essay basically up into three separate um, uh, sections. Uh, they add up to your final essay, but it's just, when I break it up, it's just easier to remember and easier to study, right? So the first part of this essay, we're breaking it up into the two movements that helped with the international response. They are the British and the Irish movements. Then we follow that up with the boycotts, the sports, cultural, academic and consumer boycotts, which then later on goes on to the campaigns, which is the disinvestments and sanctions, the release Mandela campaign and the role of the trade unions in the ending of apartheid. Right. Now, all three of these um, sections make up the entire essay. This is a long essay, but it's a lot easier to remember because it's got these subsections in. And um, please, once again, it's an essay. Dates are important. Names are important. Um, if you don't have dates and names and facts, it's your opinion. And a history essay is not about your opinion. It's about the facts, right? So please make sure you have all these dates and um, names. It is not as many as um, the civil rights movement, but it is a very extremely interesting essay. Um, so yeah, so let's start. So our first part of your essay is obviously your introduction. Your introduction you can't uh, study for because you don't know what the question is, but your next paragraph is basically um, going to be about these two movements and the influence of these two movements, right? So um, just as there was an international response to apartheid, so too, um, oh, sorry, so too was, uh, just as there was an internal response to apartheid, so too was the international co community's response to these reforms in a number of ways, okay? So the, the, these international responses increased pressure on the apartheid government not to reform apartheid, but to abandon it completely. What that means is they wanted the South African government not to just change apartheid, not to change it a bit to suit them and then carry on with apartheid. They wanted it to abandon the whole apartheid system completely. And as we know, that is eventually what happened with the internal and international movements that um, forced the apartheid government to abandon apartheid and to set up a new constitution, right? The international struggle for justice was greatly influenced by the anti-apartheid movement in Western countries that put pressure on the government and private corporations um, to in turn put pressure on the South African government. So not only were countries involved in, in um, helping the, interna um, the international community to end apartheid, but so to private companies, private corporations, trade unions, people that thought they might be quite small in comparison to a country had a lot of say in um, how the apartheid movement would be ended, right? Um, people and government in the frontline state neighboring South Africa provided support and protection um, for libera uh, liberation movements, and some of whom paid extremely heavy prices for giving their support. You also need to know that um, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, they had re Botswana, they'd recently uh, found, uh, gotten their own independence, and this gave um, the um, South African underground movements like the MK and Porku. Uh, that the, they felt more empowered to end their own political um, struggle. So the, uh, our neighboring countries helped us a lot when it came to the ending of apartheid, not just the international community. So um, when, uh, you, you know when we write an essay, every paragraph has to have a point, then it has to have your evidence and your elaboration and then your link. Now this can, um, this top, section can be seen as the point. So the both anti-apartheid movements in Britain, which in brackets double AM, which is, that's how you write it. If you want to 
um, say the double AM, you have to first say before the brackets anti-apartheid movement in Britain, please. You can't just write down the double AM, otherwise we don't know what you're talking about. Same with the anti-apartheid movement in Ireland. You can't just say the I double AM. Okay, so they both helped to end apartheid. Worries about the long-term future of South Africa deprived of markets and capitals were a key consideration for President F.W. de Klerk in releasing Nelson Mandela. Um, F.W. de Klerk didn't just think out of his own, oh, let's release Nelson Mandela. It was um, literally forced on him by the international and um, internal community to release political prisoners, right? So we focus on the two movements, which is the anti-apartheid movement in Britain and the anti-apartheid movement in Ireland. The anti-apartheid movement in Britain was founded in 1960 for eradic uh, eradication of apartheid. This grew from the boycott movement, which began in 1953. So it was founded in 1960, but grew from a boycott movement in 1953, okay? So um, in response to the appeal by Albert Lutuli, a South African um, liberation fighter to boycott South African products. Okay, so in both these Irish and British anti-apartheid movements, I want you, which is important, the year they were founded and who helped find them. Okay, so it, it was founded in 1960 and Albert Latuli helped in the anti-apartheid movement in Britain, right? And after the 1960 Shafal massacre, they changed their name to the anti-apartheid movement or just the double AM, right? The double AM resolved to work for total isolation and support the struggling against apartheid. So drew its support from a countrywide network of local anti-apartheid groups, individual members and affiliated organizations like trade union councils and constituency political parties. Okay. Now, the anti-apartheid movement in Ireland, we're going to do away with some of these points, right? Because we do repeat them later on in the boycott movements, right? So, um, it was an expansion from the British movement, which means it came out of the British movements. And it was founded in 1964 by Kara Ashmal, another South African um, guy that fought for the liberation struggle. The support was based mostly amongst Irish trade unions, the Labour Party, and was successful in persuading Irish intellectuals to um, support its embargoes. Right. Now, if you see, all the ones that um, are below it are basically um, things that we repeat in the boycotts. Right. So, I don't want you to write this as part of the Irish anti-apartheid movement. I just want you those first three points. That is um, what you're going to explain in your Irish anti-apartheid movement. So this is once again your, um, your, your point you are making in your paragraph when it comes to the sports boycotts or introducing the boycotts. So we have the sports boycotts, cultural boycotts, academic boycotts, and consumer boycotts, right? And these boycotts um, form part of our next section. And it, these boycotts are actually very easy to remember. I mean, when you say things like sports boycotts, okay? It's exactly what the word says. Sports, boycotting all sports. Okay, so when you study this, just think of sports boycotts and have your facts underneath and it should all come back to you, right? So the um, AAM and IAAM were the most successful international solidarity movements. They used a range of strategies and activities to put pressure on the apartheid government to end apartheid, right? So we look at the sports boycotts. So AAM, which is the anti-apartheid movement, and the IAAM, which is the Irish anti-apartheid movement, were successful in persuading sports players to support the embargo. So they were very successful in persuading the sports teams, the sports players, um, to not travel to South Africa, to not play in South Africa, to, um, to make sure that they isolate South Africa in the sporting world, right? Mass demonstrations forced cancellations of the Springbok cricket and rugby tours of the UK. South Africa was expelled from nearly every international sporting federation, including FIFA, so they were expelled from um, the soccer federation, the, the, the cricket, the rugby tours were stopped, and um, the non-racial Olympic committee also exiled them in 1960.
It played a major role in South Africa being excluded from the Olympic Games in 1966 and the entire Olympic movement in 1969. Okay, so in 1984, they also banned from the International Rugby Board, which means they could no longer play in the Rugby World Cups. They also didn't play in the Cricket World Cups. South Africa was isolated um, sp um, according to the sports, so no sporting events would take place with South African in them. Okay, so the Olympic Games would carry on, the Rugby World Cup would carry on, the Soccer World Cup would carry on, but South Africa would not be represented in there. Okay, so this means that they were isolated and it f affected the white South African morale, right? Uh, cultural boycotts, it's exactly what it says, culturally. South Africa was isolated. Okay, so let's look at that. So when we look at the culture, we look at um, uh, television, we look at movies, we look at um, radio, um, musicians, all of those things. Okay, so in the 1970s and 80s, there was an increasing number of entertainers and artists that were held back from visiting South Africa. So the international artists would also stop visiting South Africa, not just the South African artists couldn't go visit internationally and go give concerts or play in movies or so on, right? So also in 1975, the British Actor Union boycotted their service and no British program concerning its isolates could be sold in South Africa. Okay, so it is like DSTV. They have to buy their TV, TV programs from broad, broad, uh, broadcasting committees, like um, Grey's Anatomy, they'd buy from uh, NBC, or I'm not 100% sure, but one of those broadcasting channels, and they'd pay money for South Africa for to be shown in South Africa, to be broadcast in South Africa, right? Now, what the British um, Actors Union did, they boycotted South Africa, not being able to buy any programs from... Um, uh, from their broadcasting committee, right? So none of their programs were showed in South Africa. Okay, South African artists and entertainers were prohibited from visiting or performing in some overseas countries, and as a result, the South Africa became culturally isolated. Okay. Academic boycotts, many universities, especially in Britain and Ireland, refused to work with South African universities and allow staff to visit or teach in South Africa. Okay, so the universities overseas wouldn't allow their lecturers, their teachers, um, any of their academics to come to South Africa and teach here and um, do research here or anything like that. Same with South African academics weren't allowed to conduct research overseas. South Africa became cut off from much of the international academic world where um, we look at the consumer boycotts, consumer boycotts, exactly when you buy things, you become a consumer. So that's exactly what consumer boycotts is. It's products, your products being your everyday things you buy in the shops, as well as coal and um, steel and our exports are also products, right? We are a huge country that rely a lot on our farms. So a lot of our farming industries um, got cut off with their exports overseas. So consumer boycotts was an important part of the international anti-apartheid strategy, giving rise to the AAM and IAAM. AAM stands once again for the anti-apartheid movement and the IAAM, the Irish anti-apartheid movement, right? Persuading the public through media campaigns and demonstrations not to buy products produced in South Africa. It didn't just have an effect on your farmers, it also had an effect on um, on warehouses and factories that were producing these South African products. Remember, our products aren't just, isn't just a millie and corn and, and maize and so on. It's also products like Marmite and um, what else is, you know, Tex and Kit Kat and whatever um, is South African products, right? Um, that this could not be exported. And if we export products, not just the farmers make money from that, but also the economy. So by doing these comp consumer boycotts, you're not just damaging the actual person that produces these products, but you're also um, you're, you're causing damage to the export industry. You're causing damage to the actual um, factories that produce these products, which in turn um, has an impact on the South African economy. Right. Um, 
In December 1986, the Irish government would halt all South African food um, imports, about half of the total of South African imports into the country. Okay, they also the electricity supply board in Ireland also stopped buying South African coal. Okay. Now, the disinvestments and sanctions is a part of your essay which you can divide into two which you can do the sanctions separately and the disinvestments uh, separately, or you can put them together. I personally would break them up because it is so, such a large piece of um, the essay. So what is disinvestments? Okay, disinvestments is somebody taking their investments out of a country, right? So they don't invest anymore, right? Sanctions is um, there is a certain law or or not talked about law that people stop doing certain things, okay? So they impose certain restrictions on um, the South African government in certain ways, in, on companies, okay? So from the beginning, the AAM campaign was to persuade Western governments to impose economic san sanctions, okay? Making it, making it illegal to make loans to the South African government, invest in South African companies, buy South African products, or make joint ventures in South African companies. Now, this had a huge influence on the economic um, policies of South Africa, on the way South African uh, companies were trading. When it is illegal to make loans to South African government. So if the South African government was in trouble, they couldn't turn to anybody else, right? Until the mid-1980s, it was unsuccessful. But because there were um, constituent leaders like Ronald Reagan, he was the US president, and Margaret Thatcher, she's the prime minister of Britain, continued to support South African governments, right? So although a lot of private um, movements were calling for their governments to make these sanctions and uh, disinvestments. They didn't in the beginning, right? Eventually they would, and private companies would force the government into um, standing up for um, the South African people. In the beginning, they were rather concerned with their own financial gain than, it, than they were of um, ending apartheid, right? With the imposition of the emergencies and violent repressions, many local government, councils, universities, and private companies began to act. Okay, so five years of low economic growth in South Africa um, economically depended on investments and loans from foreign bank. Because the economy was taking such a huge hit, South African economy was, in, was dependent on international companies giving us money, loaning us money, so that we could um, carry on with our daily lives. Now, in 1986, British Barclays Bank withdrew from South Africa. Now, as we know today, British Barclays Bank, British Bank Barclays is part of um, APSA, and they're only recently in the last 20 years uh, invested back into South Africa and back into APSA. Um, so in 1986, they withdrew. In 1987, the third largest bank in um, the USA, the Chase Manhattan Bank and other banks, called back almost 500 million US dollars it had lent to South African companies. So they had lent 500 million dollars um, to South Africa and said, okay, well, pay us. They maybe had a payment plan in the next five years, in the next 10 years or so on. And um, they said in 1987, you know what, I know we said we, you've got time, but you don't anymore. We want all that money back now. So this is a big problem when it came to crippling a lot of private companies, um, government companies, um, where they actually went bankrupt because they had to repay all that money. And the value of the RAND dropped, obviously. Disinvestment, uh, disinvestment campaigns were most successful in the USA, where church-led anti-apartheid groups persuaded some universities, as well as state countries and municipality governments, to sell their shares in companies and operate, um, that operate in South Africa. So a lot of um, in private companies and uh, private corporations withdrew all their, um, their the shares in companies from South Africa. So if you if you sell all your shares, the your share price drops and your company loses a lot of money. 
So this is exactly what happened. They withdrew their shares or they sold their shares and in turn crippling a lot of companies, right? So the investors withdrew their investments in South Africa at an alarming rate. Richard Knight estimated it at 24 billion rand between 1985 and 1988. This capital fight caused a dramatic fall in the value of the ranch, which made imports and uh, much more expensive and caused inflation of 12 to 15 percent a year. Okay, now the exports obviously were um, were uh, people weren't exporting anything from us, so we wanted things from the outside world. And they're not going to say no to money, but they increased the price, which actually made it a, lo a lot harder for South African companies to import anything. We then have the release Mandela campaign. It's exactly what it says. It was a call for Mandela's release on the 11th of June 1988. It was a huge rock concert of 11 hours that was held at Wembley Stadium in London to pay tribute to Nelson Mandela on his 70th birthday. Um, stars included Peter Gabriel, Whitney Houston, Phil Collins, and 72,000 people attended this concert, and it was broadcast live to over 67 different countries with an estimated audience of over a billion people. Okay, so luckily during this time, if nobody could say anymore, they didn't know what was going on in South Africa, they didn't know about apartheid because there was TV, there was radio, there was newspapers. If you didn't know what was going on in South Africa during the time in the 1980s, 1990s, you knew now. Okay, the role of the trade unions. In the trade unions, what I want, there are three trade unions. What I want you to tell me about these three trade unions, it's a small part. I want you to tell me the date of the year it started. I want you to tell me what it actually did in helping end apartheid. That is all. The rest of the stuff you can take out, you can make it into one paragraph, all three trade unions, and then that is almost the end of our essay. All right. So, trade unions represented the rights of workers in their own countries and was in sympathy with oppressed people everywhere in the world. Okay, People that are part of trade unions are used to not um, being taken seriously, are used to having to fight for everything they want, wage increases, not being treated properly. So they really had a soft spot for anybody in the world that was being oppressed. And we know in South Africa, most of the people that were living in South Africa during the time were oppressed people. Okay, so they also had solidarity with exploited and oppressed workers across the world, which was found fertile conditions in South Africa. The majority of the people and workers in South Africa were oppressed and had no rights. The first trade union was the Norwegian Confederation of Unions, and in 1968 they started with consumer boycotts. Okay? They became the key organization in supporting of the liberation struggle in South Africa. It participated in campaigns with the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions and supported the emerging trade unions in South Africa. Okay, so the Norwegian Confederation of Unions started in 1968 and their main aim was to support the trade unions in South Africa to um, build them up so they can actually become a fighting um, force, right? It also supported these trade unions and the liberation movements financially. Right, then we have the International Transport Workers Federation. They were founded in 1886 and they re represented transport workers at the world level and promoted their interests through global campaigning and solidarity. During apartheid, it worked for the advancement of fundamental human rights and trade union rights in South Africa. So that is what they were all about. They worked for the advancement of fundamental human rights they work to support human rights and the trade union rights in South Africa. The last one is the European Confederation of Free Trade Unions. They were founded in 1973. They were active in establishing and monitoring a code of conduct for companies that invested in South Africa. So they started this campaign to... Um, check what the code of conduct was for companies, okay? So if the companies were using maybe cheap labor or they, they didn't have the right um, working hours in place and so on, then they would tell the international community, don't do business with this company. They are not treating their people fairly, okay? So they were also involved in monitoring the, monitoring the conduct of international trade unions towards South Africa and supporting the trade unions, right? So this is the end of your essay. After the trade unions, obviously, then it is your conclusion, right? So you have your introduction in the beginning, then you have your paragraphs, and remember it is 
the two movements, the British and the Irish anti-apartheid movement. Then you have your boycotts, the sports boycotts, cultural boycotts, academic boycott, and consumer boycott. Then you have your disinvestment, your sanctions, your release Mandela campaign, and the role of the trade unions, where you explain all three. And then you have your conclusion. Right. Just as... Um, all the other essays, I'm going to show you your elaboration that I want you to please um, write in your book so we don't uh, waste time uh, as soon as school starts, that we can get this down. And as you know, your elaboration is basically your memo. So if all these points are in your essays, then there's no way you can get less than 80%. What I also want you to know about your elaboration is, like all the elaborations that I give you, I take from... Um, all the memos I find online that the department sends us that I get from Eastern Cape, Western Cape, Gauteng, end of year exams, our Limpopo, and I put them all together. So if there is um, facts in there that we don't discuss in my um, presentation, it's because it's not, in our S it's not in our textbooks. Other schools use other textbooks. Obviously, there's some different information in there, but I want you to have all the information that you can have. So I put all of them in your elaboration. Okay, They are pretty cl clear cut. I'm not going to read through your whole elaboration because you know the storyline now. Um, what I want is uh, for a more consecutive story. You can go read through in your textbook just to get the background, but all the facts are in this um, in the, uh, this slideshow. Right, so I'm quickly going to go th through the elaboration. I'm not going to read through it. I'm just going to speak about other things, and then you can pause the video and write it in your book and so on. Okay. So please also know, keep it in, um, in order and write sports boycotts and explain it so that the marker actually knows what you are talking about. Right. Then we have the, the cultural boycotts and the academic boycotts. And as you see, there is a lot of information here that is not in the slides. I want you, to, when you write your essay, to go through the textbook, to go through my slides, and to go through the elaboration. Only from those three sources do you write a complete essay. You do not just focus on one section. You have to go through your textbook, my slides, and the elaboration. Only then do you have information. Right. Okay. I'm going to try my best to do all the um, essay, essays and source bases like this. So when I do um, go on maternity leave, that you have all of them on the YouTube. That um, there's no excuses for not having all the work. You see that the disinvestments and sanctions are your biggest part. And the role of the trade unions, these are just extra information. Do you see how small the role of the trade unions is in the elaboration? Okay, so, but I want you to please have our three elab um, role of the trade unions to have the dates and what they actually did for the South African government. Okay, now um, that is the end of the essay. Please um, go through it properly. Make sure you know it. I will uh, quickly put on the China, um, uh, oh, sorry, the China essay as well as the civil rights movement essay, um, so we can get our essays done first. I hope you are practicing your essays and you're not just thinking of this as a holiday. This is not a holiday, guys. You guys are supposed to be working just as much as we are. The um, the exams are coming up, you are in grade 12, we need to get as much done as possible. Good luck, stay safe. Bye.